we were really pleased that so many of you could join us for this first Five Leaves live Zoom event. Um, obviously, um, this is the first of its kind. Hopefully, there'll be many more. Um, but you please need to bear with us. There may be some technical issues along the way, which we'll hopefully be able to iron out quickly. I'd like to thank Pippa very much for her uh, hard work on putting all this together and combining our videos and teaching us how to use various bits of the uh, software and also to Rachel who's been uh, monitoring things in the background. Um, usually if we're at a five year lead event by now everyone would be sitting down with perhaps a drink in their hand having a bit of chat with their neighbours flicking through what's on the shelves. Obviously we can't um, recreate that online but we can at least have some kind of communal experience which is connected with poetry and that and that's that's a good thing i hope um originally this um session was going to be in the nottingham poetry festival so we're really pleased to be able to bring it to you in this format uh, this evening will be after a tiny bit of chat from me we'll then watch um, a number of short um videos that we've prepared and they have been linked together by pippa and during that time please feel free to put questions in the chat which we'll be monitoring some of them we'll be replying to as you ask us questions and some of them we'll pick up at the end in the final sort of discussion um, we hope to finish very promptly so people can nip out of their front doors to uh, clap for the um, nhs perhaps for one last time who knows um, so use the chat for questions and keep your um, mics muted. I think Rachel might be muting the mics for everybody. I'm not sure if she's able to do that. Uh, after the event, this, this whole thing is being filmed. So after the event, it will be available on the Five Leaves YouTube channel. So do tell all your friends about it. And there are also a link to a reading list. I've put that on my website this evening and it will be available on the Five Leaves website the, and also on the YouTube channel. So do follow that up. So why poetry and science then? What, why are we doing this event on poetry and science? Well, for me, my interest in poetry and science started many, many years ago with Miroslav Pollard, who still remains one of my absolute favorite poets. And um, he, as well as being a fantastic poet, was an immunologist, very senior scientist in Czechoslovakia, he came to Nottingham once and did a reading at um, the Lace Market Hall, which is now sadly the picture and piano pub. Um, my go-to poem of his is called Poem Technology, and it begins, it is a fuse you light somewhere in the grass. I hope tonight we'll light the fuse for you and introduce you to a number of new poems and new poets whose work you may not know, and now I'm going to hand you over to Pippa, who is going to hopefully start the filming and we will be back together at approximately 22, 22, uh, 8. Okay, over to you. Hi, I'm Pippa Hennessy. Um, I write poetry about quantum theory. Uh, when I tell people that, they usually ask, why on earth would you want to do that? Um, the answer is not easy, but I'll try and explain. Since I first heard about quantum theory when I was about 13, I've had an urgent desire to understand it. No one really understands it, of course, even geniuses who can do the complex maths involved. But basically, it's so weird, I can't help myself. Every time I think I've got my head round it, it slides off the surface of my brain. Writing poetry is a good way to figure things out, to see them from different and surprising perspectives. I was curious to see if I could write poetry to express the weirdness of quantum theory in a way that readers would feel some of my fascination with the subject and a little of my need to understand. Uh, this first poem explores that fascination and need. It's called Rebirth as a Quantum Mechanic. One, touch. Trace a line along your arm, shiver. 
Fine hairs rise up, pulling at your skin. The senses of finger touching arm and arm touched by finger cannot be separated. The two have never made contact, cannot make contact. You can never touch anything until you redefine the word touch. Two, wave particle duality. Is light a wave or a particle? This is the wrong question. The right question is, what is light? Three, curiosity. How could you not yearn to wrap your mind around a world where particles are smaller than the smallest they can be and nothing behaves the way you know it should? How could your questions not flood into the vast spaces between the nucleus of every atom and its electron shell? Four, electrons. Words pull out wrong notions. Electrons spin. Well, they behave as if they spin, but they don't, they can't. Electrons are particles. They are wave functions defining where you might find them. Electrons jump from shell to shell. This leap does not ever pass through the in-between. Five, the electromagnetic interaction. Rest your head on my shoulder. Wrap both arms around me, breathe a kiss on my lips. It stops just short of touching. The electrons of your molecules repel the electrons of mine. Inside atoms, between molecules, the weight of air on your skin. Six, now. As you breathe, question the air. How do you? Empty space made up of more empty space. Push my lungs outwards. If you see a cat in a box, wonder, how does light, something that cannot be imagined, project you into my mind? When you embrace your children, ask, how can we feel when we can never touch each other's warmth? Quantum theory really is weird. I still haven't completely grasped what goes on inside the nucleus of an atom, but I know it involves quarks of various different colours held together by gluons. There are several bizarre rules about how these should combine, not least of which is that you can never know exactly how many subatomic particles there are, because they're always randomly coming into being and disappearing. I wrote a semi-silly poem inspired by some of the rules. It's called Quantum Dating. You'll never find a quark at a singles bar. They prefer to spin in trees, each dressed in a different colour. An unstable quark might pair up with an anti-quark. But couplings never last long. With luck, you may catch a quark on the rebound. Keep account of the W bosons in your vicinity. Quarks are notorious for hooking up with them on a whim and dumping them just as thoughtlessly. They don't mean anything by it. But it does change their flavour. Ignore the rumours of tetraquarks and pentaquarks. Involvement with these exotic hadrons is only for the adventurous and is strongly discouraged. When you've got your quark, find out if it is up, down, strange, charm, top or bottom. It doesn't matter to them, they're not fussy, but you shouldn't confuse your charmed bottom with your double bottom. No one knows what that might be. I read a lot about quantum theory. I even ploughed through a brief history of time from cover to cover twice. It's actually a damn good book. As I read, I felt quite envious of the clever people who actually understand it well enough to make new discoveries. And I wonder what that would feel like, which led to this poem. Blackboard. I brushed chalk from my hands. I finished. The boy sneezes. He puts his Nintendo down mutters, does that really mean anything? I say, wipe your nose. How do I tell a small scowling child that this final set of chalk marks, this glorious transcendent equation, unifies the four fundamental forces? How do I tell him 
that I have calculated the true nature of gravity. I say, yes, it explains everything. It tells me why you're here, where you came from, how our world and all the other worlds began and how they will end. He says, but it can't tell me what I'm having for tea tonight. I say, beans on toast. He says, and I scream for pudding. I study the chalk marks. Say yes, and I scream for pudding. As I continued with the project, I realised my family were creeping more and more into the poems. In fact, the whole thing had turned on its head. I was writing about quantum theory, but I was finding out more about myself and how I fit into my world, and about poetry itself. Quantum theory had become, for me, a metaphor for life. Something marvellous, complex, confusing, and incredible in every sense of the word. This poem tries to encapsulate that. The Standard Model of Particle Physics The standard model of particle physics contains four fundamental forces. The strong nuclear force explains how we stay whole. The weak nuclear force dictates the outcome of our decay. Gravitational force attracts us to each other. Electromagnetic force pushes us apart. Two, the standard model does not explain the force of gravity why I can't stop my hand falling on my wife's grey hair. The standard model does not explain the expansion of the universe, how we are all separating at an increasing rate. The standard model does not contain dark matter particles. What else would have pulled the light from my father's eyes? The standard model contains three generations of quarks and leptons, but no unborn child though I know mine briefly lived. The standard model does not explain the emptiness of my son's bedroom or the way the lawn grows, now he's not here to mow. The standard model does not explain how my other child has changed or how she remains the same white-haired boy who always arrives late. The standard model does not reflect the photograph albums on my shelves, there are no equations for stories calculated by him. The standard model imagines three colours and three anti-colours, but not the greying of my hair and my need to dye it regularly. The standard model ignores a crying baby's needs and the inconstant value of time in my wife's arms. Thank you. That's. Um, all about me and my poetry. Um, I'm just going to talk about a couple of other poets now who um, have written about science and have published a couple of things relating to science. So that's Scientific Papers by David Morley and Magnetic Resonance Imaging by John Glover. David Morley's poems are often not scientific per se, but they tend to make a nod to science. For instance, in oceanography, only the title hints at science, but that gives us a lens through which to look at the poem, which gives a different perspective on its subject matter. I'll read the first stanza. Apart from the sea, we have the weather in common, but the morning moves on like a dunlin, precarious, stilt walking on her own reflection. A steamer's vapour has collapsed on itself over the ocean. So because the title invites us to read the poem through a scientific lens, reflection has been given overtones of physics and psychology um, and collapsed on itself sounds to me like something from quantum theory. Uh, one thing I've found when I'm writing poetry about science is that inev it inevitably slides into the personal. This happens in Morley's poems too. For instance, the first couplet of Mathematics of Light is the wavelengths of daylight register on bright equipment. And the poem finishes with, it's down to the human to live it, take it in, keep my sunlight warm for me. John Glover's collection was inspired by his experiences in an MRI scanner when he was being diagnosed with MS. 
Although only the third of the four sections in the book contains poems about science, scientific images crop up throughout. For instance, the first two sentences in Walking, Not Waking are waking to white lightning. It's hard to think it doesn't know what it's about. It's creaking overhead and squeezing the electric clouds. And in The Sun Rocking, there's the wonderful image of swinging like a baby's first love affair with gravity in the park swing. The third section of the book is called the MS Poems, and many of these are more explicitly about science. For example, the first stanza of CERN, Frontiers, Gravediggers, is Like the infinitely splitting particles circling to destruction between Switzerland and France, why bother with them? It seems I'm digging them out for the sake of it. Sick. Really sick. Glover writes about science in his poetry because they're both fascinating. I can understand that, but I'm the same. So I'll finish by quoting from the preface of Dark Matter, Poems of Space, a collection edited by Morris Reardon and Jocelyn Bell Burnell of old and new poems about the stars, the planets and humankind's place in the universe. This section explains brilliantly why some poets, myself included, can't help writing about science. Who could not be intrigued by the profound implications of space science, its big bangs and phase transitions, its black holes and collapsed stars? And this is to say nothing of the metaphors and mental pictures that physicists themselves invent and relish. We know our knowledge is flimsy, mathematically inept, imaginatively limited but we would be dull and blinkered beings if we didn't try to understand a little of what the scientists are arguing about. Thank you very much. Hello. I've been fortunate to have worked on a range of outward facing artistic commissions over the past 15 years. My main collaborative partner, the artist who has helped me the most to think about the relationship between words and images, is Paul Evans, he initiates projects that ask scientists, doctors, researchers, poets, artists, graphic designers to talk to each other and create new works of art. He's the main reason why I'm sitting here today talking about and reading from poems that focus on scientific discovery. The first extended piece of cooperative engagement I worked on with Paul was Cells. Paul created these rather beautiful watercolours, abstract in nature, recalling, I think, the way biologists stain cells to reveal transparent structures that would otherwise be invisible to the eye. Paul emailed me PDFs of the paintings over a nine month period between 2006 and 2007 and asked me to reflect on their designs in a sequence of poems. In the end, I settled on writing a collection of haiku, three-line poems, that not only dwell on the bi biological epicentre of life, but also things like terrorist cells, cell phones, monks at prayer, and their monastic cells, and so on. Here are three pieces from this series of 15 poems that I eventually wrote each one untitled, accompanied by a painting. The ultrasound gleams rib light on coral fingers, your heart a quick fish. News of the virus blew eastwards as starlings swerved and shimmered at dusk. Redwoods survive fires, the way would like to outlive pain. Old heart, new skin. This sequence segues neatly into the next couple of poems I'm going to read, which are respectively a haiku and tanka, which is a kind of five line version of a haiku. 
So I work with Paul Evans and another poet, Matt Clegg, on poems, artworks that were going to be displayed in the new Cancer Genetics Building in Cardiff. As part of our research with the Commission, we spent the day in the Welsh capital talking to scientists, researchers, about what they do as clinicians. Among other things, they talked about prognosis, how they established if patients were ill or not. They talked about diagnostic techniques, including Western blotting and flow cytometry. I was taken by this idea that in flow cytometry, you illuminate the cells with a laser beam and from an analysis of the wavelengths emitted of how the cells react to being bombarded, you can test if someone has a blood cancer or not. This is my poem inspired by this process. Seed each cell with light, then tell how the brightest stars are first to flare out. On the back of the Cancer Research Building Commission, we were also asked to produce artworks, words, to herald the acquisition of a new PET, a positron emission tomography scanner, on site in Cardiff. Here's my poem that meditates on a body being injected with radioactive tracers so the imaging devices can map the reaches of the body. And this is one of the images I was working from. Fed with gold, you dream of sunbanks, sunspots, finches. Your blood silts up with light, heart glitters metal traces. Wade, your body is precious. In 2012, I worked with Paul and the photographer Carl Hurst out there at the Alfred Denny Museum at the University of Sheffield. The museum is overseen, run by Professor Tim Burkhead, who is well known as a bird behavioural specialist. He asked us to provide images and poems that celebrated some of the specimens on display in the collection. I wrote two poems for the project. The one I'm happiest with, I'm going to read to you now. The piece originated from conversations I had with Paul about pre-Darwinian thoughts on evolution. One such idea is re recapitulation theory. The argument goes that as the embryo of the animal gestates, its form mutates from earlier evolutionary stages of that animal, i.e. its remote ancestors, to more recent biological descendants. I was also given this photographic image to work from. Recapitulation theory surmises we begin as fish, then wriggle out with features like a frog's or lizard's before the mammal in its surfaces. These creatures sniff the air for something, clawing at the light that keeps them pinned, the lost terrain contoured on their skin. They burrowed up from deep inside our heads, a swerve we cannot shake. We ask of them the hardest things, to feel, to speak. The final project I'm going to discuss that brings me almost up to date is the Rose of Temperaments, a group poetry commission focused on colour theory. The project's title is derived from the Temperamentum Rose, compiled by Goethe and Schiller in 1798-99. Six poets who are displayed on the pamphlet here were each given a primary or secondary colour red, purple, blue, green, yellow, or orange to write about. I was given green, but it was to the far sightedness and imagination of the curators, Paul Evans and the publisher Brian Lewis, 
but we also got paired with another poet and got to recolor or rewrite each other's poems. So I was paired with Alastair Noon and got to dream his sonnet entitled Red. Without disappearing down multicolored rabbit holes, I'm just going to read my original poem here, Green. William is charmed with pale green eyes. They're born of black and yellow melanin, a trail of jeans, some soap down the sofa prize, pincered out to mark the Irish in him. Think oxidized copper, honeydew green, a mineral's polish, heavy bottled glass. Picture a wet roof's mossy sheen. Go back to one summer at your swimming baths, where the water wobbles sun and colour. Kind of greenish blue, bluish green, that glows and bubbles when you push under. You cut this bowl, a dream, jade porcelain, but nothing is precise enough. You wonder at his eyes, their pigments, textures. Dream again. Briefly, I'm going to highlight three poets who I think write in interesting, imaginative ways about science. The first writer is Derek Collins, who I'll mention here first because you might not have heard of him. He used to attend my adult education creative writing classes in the 1990s at the University of Sheffield. He was a very unassuming man, but was sharp as a bag of knives. He was professor of mathematics at the institution, so unlike us tourists, he really did understand the given theorems and equations. This book, Aftermath, was published by his friends after his death in 2015. He begins the poem, where T stands for time, thus. Physics can make it seem simple. Time is a straight line. T minus past, T plus future. And then adds, but we've never learnt the trick of this. Follow time's arrow into the future, clutching our little bags of memory. Butterflies, spiders, trapped in the amber of the past. I've picked two Irish writers as my other two ambassadors for science and poetry. Maurice Reardon's Floods, published back in 2000 by Faber, is a very fine collection. The majority of the poems reflect in some way on scientific process, whether the focus is on Otzi, the Iceman, exhumed from his resting place after nearly 5,000 years high up on the mountainous border between Austria and Italy, or on not experiencing the ultraviolet catastrophe, or the dropping of a wine glass, which becomes a mini lecture on gravity and the warping of space time. In Casson, he works through a little thought experiment where our ears are, were like bats so that we saw the world as noise. He writes, we could view our neighbors eating lunch or in their pool, while our furthest vista might be the ocean or a vestigial wave roar from the galaxies. And finally, I come to Sinead Morrissey, who has now published six collections of poetry. The two that are probably most science focused are her 2009 collection, Through the Square Window, and her, her most recent book, On Balance, published in 2017 by Carcanet. I like the way she stitches the science through her books, as it's often done very lightly. If the subject matter interests her, takes her up, she explores these ideas, theories, with scrupulous intelligence and finds imaginative ways of turning them into poems. So for instance, in Through the Square Window, she writes a poem entitled A Device for Monitoring Brain Activity by Shining Light into the Pupil, or devises a poem essay on the history of matter. Science always seems to be there or thereabouts in her world. In her fascination with photography, when she talks about giving birth, 
describing the effects of ice on landscape and having the flu. In her collection on balance, she writes about witnessing meteor shells, the zoology of Napoleon's horse, Marengo, and details the work of a marine biologist who tells us ocean vertebrates are inconceivably lovely. Each morning, I lower a bucket over the side of the ship, clank it back up on deck, then stick my hand inside the seas, feeling back. Last Friday, I identified an entire new species of annelid, a male and female, framed and translucid under the microscope's hood. They appeared to be having sex. Hi, it's Sue again. I spent the last few months being shielded away from the world, so much so that even the bottom of our road seems like alien space. It's been said that during lockdown, people are learning to appreciate their surroundings much more. That is if they're lucky enough to have somewhere decent to live in the first place. These first two poems capture something of that close to nature observation that you might be doing at the moment. Listen to the light. Listen to the light, spreading its news of spring, where the worm rises through warm, slowly warming soil. Listen to the light, scattering through willows whose whippy branches test their strength and yearn to dazzle streams with acid green livery. Listen to the light, among sparrows flitting through hawthorn, blackbirds calling for mates in the lengthening afternoons. Listen to the light. Marking an end, maybe soon, to mad march, savagery, blue eggs in an old nest. The second one's about the butterfly, copper month. The small copper basks in a month of sun, skitters over grasses and gardens, verges and meadows, alert to intruders, sees off rival blues, tussles with hoverflies, darts to in intercept small heaths and hair streaks, 31 days of sun-filled skirmishes, lightning chases over downland, playing, feeding, courting, mating, laying eggs on sorrel and heather, leaving the next lifetime to new wings. The next two poems draw on science-related experiences in Tenerife. The first is a completely found poem, which draws on the language of the plant labels that I read as we were going round Mount Tiede National Park. How to survive above the clouds. Mount Tiede National Park, Tenerife. Resist, resist tough extremes of temperature by reducing exposure. Cover your leaves with downy hairs, beeswax or similar. Adopt hemispherical forms, rosettes or a pillow shape to provide greater protection for your most delicate interior parts. Sport bright coloured flowers, hot red, canary yellow, dazzling white and violet are popular to attract pollinating insects and birds. Release a large volume of seeds into thin mineral soil or disperse them to the winds to enhance your chances of reproduction. Find out how others develop their ability to survive in adversity and learn to thrive in our harsh high mountains. The second poem was written following a visit to the observatory high above the clouds in Tenerife which you get to go to along an extraordinary road where professional cyclists practice altitude in their teams. And there's still snow on the ground, even though the rest of the island has sunny temperatures. This is about the astrophysicists who live there, and they can only live there for a limited amount of time. Astrophysicists. They're a breed apart, the astrophysicists. 30 heads living in transparent skies among silver blue brightness where residual snow tricks visitors into a full sense of warmth. 
they ignore earthly matters, preferring to draw zodiacal light down 46 meter telescopes, pour over re refracted images, solar granules, dissect sunspots, time lapse deep space, peruse brown dwarfs in three dimensions. They were sleepy at first, the astrophysicists, but thrive now in high altitude, bodies aligned to star rhythms. After lunch, they will revisit microwaves from the Big Bang, catch its last millisecond. I'm fascinated by scientists at work and perhaps even more so by the language they use and the ways in which that language could be misinterpreted. Here's an example, hunting the bosun. Across the universe in Higgs field, the bosun hunt continues. Great minds seek fundamental particles, search for a shower, an elusive trail among exotics, a momentary sign in the atomic soup. Physicists don their bosun stalkers, trudge through metaphorical snow, watch and wait for terriers to acquire mass, seas whizzing through space at the speed of light. I'm very interested in concrete poetry and the use of page space. I've published a number of poems in anthologies for children which take up very different spaces on the page. The latest of these is Perseids. Uh, the Perseids are a meteor shower which usually occur in the Western Hemisphere in August. Te two years ago I was very lucky to see the shower in its full glory. All our neighbours were away, there was rarely little light pollution and we snuck up to our allotment with a torch in the dark to gaze in wonder. Perseids was published in Spaced Out which is a anthology of space poems for young people, edited by Brian Moses and James Carter. And it looks like that, <laughs> which you might not be able to see. I'll just read you a couple of lines. Flipped high above moonlit earth, beam their lightsaber blades across lonely places. Keep us spellbound, a million volts sprint a sparkling hundred meters mesmerizing meteors their flaming tails smudge out darkness zip 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 open the dark before their light takes flight and they are gone the next few poems come from the mistake section of my most recent uh, collection published by shoestring press what They Left Behind, which is available at all good Five Leaves bookshops. Like many of the other science-related poems I've talked about so far, my interest in writing them has focused on the language aspects of science. During extensive treatment for breast cancer, I encountered many different medical people, and what struck me about them most was the differences between the way they used language to explain what was happening to me and to what extent they considered the impact of that language on me, the patient, and on my partner, Dave. This small poem sums that up. It's called Medical Humanities. Before taking temperature, testing urine, drawing blood, measuring pulse, hearing heart, marking skin, inserting cannula, masking up, cutting through. Please listen to my mind. I became increasingly interested in the chemical structure of DNA as a result of what was happening to me and as you'll hear in the next two poems. First one's called Spelling It Out. Spelling it out. You make the beginning of every internal word. You are metaphor and reality. Three letters tell my ribosomes to spell out protein pearls, string together a thousand amino acids inside each beautiful bead. Although you always dazzle folk with your sexy flexing chain, 
Somewhere along my twisting, untwisting, zipping, unzipping ladder, you made a mistake. When did this happen? 1962? 1932? 1898? Where does my error lie? Upstream or downstream? And what were my odds? 50 50-50? One wrong letter. Is the miscreant A or T? Adenine or timine? G or C? Guanine or cytosine? One wrong letter. Proliferating. The last poem of mine that I want to talk to you about is DNA Time. This started life during conversations about poetry and science with my dear friend, structural biologist, Italian poet and polymath, Pietro Reversi, and culminated in drafting a collaborative double-stranded poem, DNA Time, written with embedded DNA coding. The poem's format reflects the double helix structure of DNA, which is composed of four nucleotides, adenine A, timine T, cytosine C, guanine G. They're always paired, A opposite T and C opposite G. The process began with Sue writing what we call a protein poem. So I wrote this first, the chain twists, spirals, shapes each destiny, differently translates lives as rare, certain, less defined. This can be read as the sequence of a protein and it makes no use of the letters B, J, O, U, X or Z. Those letters never appear. It is hidden within the actual poem itself. I then wrote the first section of the poem. Each line had to contain words which included one of the four key letters A, T, C, G in a particular order. I had to work with a number of restrictions. I could, couldn't write and use prepositions like by, in and upon as they didn't have any of those letters within them, A, C, G or T. Um, and the poem looks like this and you will be able to download a copy of it from the link that's available that goes with this um, presentation. So, all child time contained patterned acts, foreign, rare franked stamps, hinged commemoratives, catalogued according to gibbons, scales practised daily, tiny sky scraps arranged, jigsaw corners searched and selected. Mammal tracks magnified, golden leaves traced, petals sought, picked, flattened beneath encyclopedias, spirograph created intricate images, felt tip colours and carandash pencils shaded within margins, early evening battleships, drafts, chessmen, Chinese checkers threatened, plastic counters crept along ladders, avoiding gigantic coiled snakes, continuous knitting clipped, lengthening scarves, v-necks, cardigans. So that is the, just the first verse of the poem. Pietro then developed a counter poem, um, an anti-scent strand as we called it, um, which contained the appropriate opposite letter to those used in my poem. So if, if a word of my poem was chosen because it contained an A, the matching word of the Pietro's complementary stand needed to contain a T. So it's a highly complex thing to work out. And on the page, the, po the poem is written so that at 180 degrees notation. So my poem starts here, here, and goes this way, and Pietro's goes the other way. Um, so if you'd like to read the whole poem, please um, access the chat and find a link to it there. I hope you enjoyed that very varied um, introduction to a range of different um, different poems. This is really just a taster to hopefully send you scurrying away to find all these these poets. I'd like to very briefly mention two other poets, Rebecca Elson, whose brilliant book, um, 
the res a responsibility to all published by Carcanet in 2001 contains a fantastic sequence of poems drawing on her work as an astronomer her, her work on d d dark matter and a range of other things including helium and the big bang and a series of notebooks within it um, which explore how she drafts the poems and also Philip Gross uh, another Carcanet poet who has been writing about sort of shifting dimensions and frontiers and um, the water table and dark matter and loss of speech for a long time. In this particular collection, Dark Matter, he talks about coming to terms with his, um, with his father's loss of language due to deafness and then due to aphasia. And the poem Deep Field combines all that exploration along with the discussion about the skewed um, lens in the Hubble telescope which needed to be replaced and um, that is something which Rebecca Elson also deals with and on the page he again is very interesting you see that one bit of that poem where he's exploring um, the space uh, uh, of the page really effectively to um, tease out issues about his father's loss of language and finally a Sonnet to Science by Sam Illingworth, which is a series of essays about Holub, Elson, Ada Lovelace, and a number of other people. So do look out for more information about those. So we've got just a few minutes, and I wonder if we have any questions. Let's have a look. Somebody said, I think he's blood axe, not carcanet. I'm not sure what that was referring to. Is it referring to, oh yes, he is, he is, yes, sorry, he's, he's blood axe, not carcanet. Okay, any, any questions from anyone um, that you would like to ask us? Don't be frightened now, I can see you all there looking eagerly, waiting for someone to start. Dave's, David Belbin's giving us a big clap, <laughs> and it is nearly time for the big clap. <laughs> David Belbin's listening in another room, thankfully. So somebody else is saying, thank you, wonderful. I think I've got a question for, for Pippa and, and Chris, and that is, when you first started to write about science, what, what was it that first got you into writing about science? And is it a different thing now, or has it been developed further? Um, after you, Chris. Okay, so um, I was very fortunate to meet people through my um, through my adult life, who've talked to me about science and tried to explain it to me. So when I moved to Sheffield many years ago, I'm, I, I shared a house with a physicist called James, and he was great. He kind of got me in, involved, introducing to the idea of thinking about science. Um, and my father-in-law was a chemist as well, and they both chucked books in my direction. Uh, some are easier than others. I, I um, the Dancing Wooly Masters is one that I would highlight actually. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very good book on physics it's probably my favorite book on physics it's, it is very um understandable i think and it's very <laughs> graspable um and uh, a lot of it's about conversations and dialogue with people so when it comes to the projects i get involved with a lot of that is about me actually almost stepping out outside myself and thinking about communicating with people whether that's the artist i work with like paul or my good friend Brian Lewis, who's uh, who has also helped me along the way over the last sort of 15, 20 years. Um, and yeah, it's that it's having those conversations with people and thinking about how do you talk about science to uh, to a whole different sort of raft of of people who probably don't think about it. They just they don't think about it from day to day or if they encounter out my my poems in, in whatever situation they they see it for a minute so it's about them thinking having that little thought mm. that little part that you talked about um at the start uh, i think sue um so yeah that's why that's why i do it i think it's to communicate and to be in conversation i think with with other people great um i thought it was lovely what you said pippa at the beginning um how could you not yearn to wrap your mind around the world? I thought, wow, that's mm. such a mind-blowing thing to, <laughs> to think about in terms of, you know, how you want to engage with the world and through, through language. 
yeah very much so i mean i'm i I started off with a science background i studied psychology and computer science came to writing very late um so it was kind of natural i guess that i would write about science but part of it was it's it's just to try and understand it in some way and i find poetry is a really good way of understanding things um Mm. there's a question on the chat do you write about science primarily to explore your own emotions and experiences or the wider world or to dig into the detail of science itself i think it's all three of those i think you write you write poetry to explore emotions and experiences in the wider world and then you write poetry about science to dig into the detail of the science and it, it it's kind of all mixed up but um yeah it's, that's it's, interesting that isn't it yeah because for me a lot of the attraction is about language and about mm. um making sense of that language and and playing around with it and almost like having more control of what might be happening to you because you understand the language um would be one angle for me to come at it and then we've got a question there from ruth did you notice the science in poetry not quite sure what that means but uh i suppose yeah as in, i mean there is science, science in poetry there is it, yeah in terms of its i suppose it's it's techniques and it's um um it's symmetries i guess um it's structures and shapes yes. and the, and the yeah the science of words as well you know etymology yes. how they develop that's that's kind of scientific too yes definitely any other questions from anyone before we call it today it's brilliant to have an audience that you can see you're in everybody's homes and looking at what's in the, their backgrounds and and just um bringing bringing five leaves to a much wider audience of people who couldn't possibly come to nottingham on a thursday night for an hour's session but can can nip in through this means to to be with us um I hope you've enjoyed this evening and I hope that you will want to sign up for more of these events and or participate in them and do go away and read some more and swamp Ross Bradshaw with lots of orders and we hope to see you very very soon and when will the um, video go up on YouTube? Uh, In the next couple of days I'll have to to, um, upload it which takes hours but yeah it won't be long. So will you you email everybody? Yes. With the link. Yes. Sorry, Chris, you were going to say? There is a reading list as well, isn't it, that we've prepared? Yeah, and there's a reading list. I've put the reading list up on my um, website this evening, suedimmockpoetry.com, and it will be up with the um, video as well. And I was going to email it to everyone as well. Well, so. won't it? Won't it think you said? Yeah yeah. 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 It will be accessible. Okay. Well, thank you very, thank you very much, everybody. There's some lovely um, comments in the chat. And um, it's really nice to be with you. And, you know, let's not, um, let's not be strangers. And I'll see you all soon. Cheerio. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Pippa. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. <laughs>